Thank you for registering for Know the Word's third webinar, How Shall We Then Live? A roundtable discussion offering practical advice to help deal with the issues of stress, loneliness, and fear brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Designed to help you or others you know understand and work through these issues from a biblical perspective. Since 1995, Know the Word has been dedicated to strengthening and encouraging God's people everywhere through the ministry of God's Word and faith-building activities. Through conferences, community Bible studies, webinars, fellowship luncheons, and other ministry events, Know the Word has ministered to thousands of Christians over the years. It maintains a website at knowtheword.com and also provides a convenient and easy-to-use app available on the App Store or Google Play under Know the Word Ministries. In addition, Know the Word is a federally recognized 501c3 nonprofit and can issue tax-deductible receipts for contributions in accordance with IRS regulations. Gifts to the ministry can be made to donorbox.org slash knowtheword. Thank you for your interest and prayerful support for the work of the Lord through this organization. For more information, email us at knowtheword at gmail.com. part-time in nursing homes and is involved with hospice care. Uh, recently, of note to, for the, our audience, uh, he did recently contract the coronavirus, as you can see, he's come through it very well. So we'll be talking about that as well. Our final panelist is uh, Mr. Rob Sullivan, and uh, he comes from the world of finance. He's the president of Believer Stewardship Services, a ministry that helps Christians with estate planning, plan giving, and in matters related to assembly, and assembly-related governance matters. He's a graduate of Emmaus Bible College. He's graduated from the University of Notre Dame in finance and business economics. From 1996 to 2014, he worked at Morgan Stanley, eventually became executive director. Uh, he was responsible for launching the Information Security Office and the Information Risk Oversight Functions and oversaw all security integration matters related to global wealth management groups, merger with Smith Barney. And he can explain a little bit of that himself a little bit later on. That's a mouthful. He also served as a liaison for the firm with the United States Marine Corps and its economic development program in Iraq. In 2014, he left that and joined the staff of Believer Stewardship Services, becoming president in 2015. I could say more, but my printer ran out of all my paper when I ran through his resume. Well, it's nice to have all of you men with us this evening. We look forward to an edifying time in the Lord as we consider some of the things that we've been talking about, issues that have been related 
uh, perhaps uh, exacerbated with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, whether it's anxiety or fear or worry or depression or whatever it might be, we are looking forward to hearing some of your insights and some practical advice. There are many, many people watching this evening, and I know they're looking for helpful advice as well. Our man behind the scenes is Robbie Youssef. If you've seen any of these webinars, Robbie is our technical guy, and uh, he runs uh, Axios One, a nonprofit to assist in the technological needs of uh, local churches and to make them more effective in their ministry for the Lord. So periodically, Robbie will pop in with a question or two that you are encouraged to uh, send in to us as the viewing audience. All you have to do is hit that question box uh, over on your screen and you can submit a question. We may not be able to get to all those questions. We'll try to do the best we can, but we will also try to answer them afterwards as well uh, in our follow-up uh, course, uh, correspondence or communication with you. My name is Mark Colch and I'm with Know the Word and I'll be the moderator for tonight's webinar. So to get things going, we'd like to ask uh, Dr. Steve Price to open this time in a word of prayer. Dr. Price. Thank you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you that he is the seat of all wisdom and understanding, that he um, holds all knowledge and, and uh, 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 is custodian of all of the answers to our questions and dilemmas, that he is the uh, embodiment of wisdom. And Father, tonight we can have many words, but really what we desire is a word from our Lord, a word through the Spirit of God. And, and we ask that that might be done through your written word and through the discussion about your written word concerning the issues of our, of our concern. Father, we uh, appeal to you, we call upon you, uh, that you might grant us this request this evening for all those who are attending and who may hear this in the future, and uh, we do ask for your blessing uh, tonight on this gathering, on each of my colleagues, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Price. Uh, before we begin, I want to make this uh, statement. This discussion tonight is general in nature and does not constitute uh, medical advice or professional counseling on a formal level. Uh, we do recommend that you consult with your spiritual oversight in your local fellowship. For your particular case and you seek personal advice uh, from a professional counselor for any specific issues you may have. Well to get things rolling this evening I thought we would uh, direct our first question to Dr. Jacob. Dr. Jacob again is uh, a psychologist and uh, has much experience in this line of work. Uh, I want to ask you Dr. Jacob, uh, we have heard and seen many reports now of course the coronavirus now claims uh, according to the news, some 110,000 deaths in the U.S. alone, and that's a quarter of the deaths across the world. So we have a high percentage of that, if you can trust those figures. Um, ever since this pandemic hit uh, sometime in February and really full uh, in March, uh, everybody's schedule has been flipped upside down. Children have had to stop schooling and transition to homeschooling or Zoom uh, schooling or whatever you want to call it uh, in their homes. There's a lot of change that's taken place. Um, schedules have changed completely. Some people have lost their jobs. Some people have lost their employment, uh, their, their means of income rather through the loss of employment. A lot of things have changed. And uh, looming on the horizon is some talk that maybe even the winter time, this uh, pandemic may continue on and the virus may return. Uh, let me ask you, what toll has this taken on the American family and uh, how has it manifested itself in, in various families? Well, that's a great question. And I think, you know, the effects of something as severe as this uh, might only be known much later as many things are. But currently, you know, what we're seeing uh, in general is a lot of fear, anxiety and anger. Uh, these are very common themes that are persistent uh, throughout generation uh, throughout the the people that we deal with um, you know we're used to uh, doing a lot of things in life and because of that a lot of our insecurities or shortcomings are distractions take over we go to different activities and because of that nothing all will come out 
in the forefront. So, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of this uh, people that are, are afraid to even sometimes openly talk about uh, certain things because a lot of confusion. And, you know, I wanted to just uh, mention that as uh, and it's something that we really need to work on, which is uh, unity among all of us. You know, the, the devil works on creating disunity and through that caught a lot of division. Whatever in the family is going on, we all need to support each other, which we usually do. Think about it. If somebody had cancer in our family, we would all get together and, and somehow support that person. But when it comes to fear, anxiety and any kind of mental issues, we kind of leave them alone. We don't want to we'd say let them take their time. Uh, we may not send, you know, get the help that they need. So it's really important that people come together, support them spiritually, encourage them to seek help if it's not within there, it's something they can manage, um, and really understand the struggles they're going through are not just imagined. Some of it may be fears because it's you know our mind is very powerful. At the same time, uh, these emotional struggles are real and can be helped with the proper guidance and direction. Right. When you mentioned about people being angry, why uh, why are some people angry? I can understand the fear uh, from the virus, perhaps catching the virus, but why the anger? Well, you know, psychologist Freud would say anger is one of our most basic emotions that we feel. If there's an emotion that we can all identify with is anger. That is very common. Now, most of us manage it, as the Lord says, do not, you know, do not go to sleep on your anger. There's many verses like that that encourages us. But anger is a very common uh, emotion that most of us have learned to either sublimate through our activities. Like I would say, I became a psychologist. I manage a lot of my anger that way. I used it through sports and I manage my anger that way. Uh, but that is a very common anger that is, you know, always lying under under the ground that comes about when these kind of situation exposes us. Okay, you mentioned about the anger there and the fear. Certainly you've seen it in children because you work with children. Do you do you also work with adults at all? I, I work with a lot of adults as well, a lot more than children. In, in my uh, full time, I work with a lot more uh, uh, children. In my prior practice, majority of patients are, are, are uh, adults and uh, they have similar experiences. I think the young people, uh, are kind of in their formative years, and uh, I'm, but I'm surprised that they're not as resilient as I thought they would be through this crisis. They seem to be really struggling with the isolation, lack of social interaction. Uh, they're really uh, having a tough time with that. Okay. Well, let me ask uh, Dr. Reimer. Uh, he works in a senior care facility. And I'm sure you have seen fear amongst the senior community. Can you ex describe your experience there? Um, sure. The um, <clears throat> and I can give you my personal example too. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. When I when uh, I got the virus. Yes. Uh, you know, back in in March, that's uh, when uh, most of our audience. Uh, was not able to see their loved ones in nursing homes anymore. They uh, they went to a no visitor policy, and uh, and even in the nursing home there was a lot of uh, restrictions uh, as well. And that of course upset a lot of families, upset a lot of residents. And then there was the fear of uh, fear of the virus. And I see patients in four nursing homes, and and uh, and of course we as the healthcare providers, uh, physicians and nurses had a big fear of what this was going to do. We had seen that what happened out in Seattle where a large percentage in a, in a healthcare facility had died and so on. So, so this was toward the end of, end of March and, uh, and uh, it, we had heard a lot of these things, hadn't seen many cases in Augusta. I admitted a patient. Uh, to a nursing home, and then uh, after I admitted, and she had been in a long-term hospital for 30 days, hadn't had any visitors during that time, and uh, everybody just assumed that she did not have COVID-19. Uh, she wasn't tested, uh, and back then there was a lot of testing that wasn't going on, 
and a lot of tests weren't available. And uh, she wasn't tested, but she, everybody assumed she hadn't been exposed. So I admitted her. Later on that night, she uh, went into respiratory failure, was taken to the hospital. And four days later, when the test came back that the hospital did, she was positive. So I got a call on a Saturday evening, you know, saying this patient I had taken care of was positive. Mm. And uh, now I was, I was feeling okay until then. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I began to wonder, uh oh, what are some of these symptoms? You know, I took my temperature; it's uh, 99 and a half, and that's all, maybe a little higher than, than I would normally have. Uh, and then I thought, well, do I have any shortness of breath? And the more I thought about it, you know, well, if I take a deep breath, you know, it does seem a little short, and my chest gets a little tight, and you know, and maybe I do have these symptoms, and. So I got tested and um, on the following Monday, and sure enough, I was positive. Now, I, I really think a lot of those symptoms were anxiety uh, right. and uh, the result, physical symptoms of anxiety, but, um, but perhaps very mild symptoms of the illness. But, the, uh, but I remember at that time, my own fear and anxiety, and I'm not generally a real anxious person, but my wife can attest that. I do get overly concerned about things. So I went to one of my go-to verses for that, uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And in fact, uh, that's one of my favorite prescriptions to write. I, I write a lot of prescriptions with that. Pull out the prescription pad and put on there, this is what I want you to do. And I write, memorize Philippians 4, 6, and 7. That right. Be anxious, that's for, nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Right. And everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And uh, that was a help, as it always is. Well, that's a great testimony, uh, Dr. Reimer. Uh, in your heart of hearts, when you heard that she was positive and you had been taking care of her, and of course, in the early stages of this, the tests were four days. They they ramped them up and got them shorter in the course of time. But but then you found out. I mean, did you figure this this could be it? Did you have that pass yeah. in your mind? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Because now I'm in the I'm in a high age group risk, high risk uh, age group. So uh, yeah, and we had uh, you know and and we had all been listening to the news. We've been hearing about this. We had seen what happened in this other nursing home, and actually even in this nursing home that I worked in. As a result of that one patient, uh, over the next few days and weeks, 90 out of 100 patients tested positive, and 30 wow. of them tested positive. Wow. Now, uh, not near that many passed away. Uh, right. I think total after a couple months, there were eight, and half of them were probably not from the virus, but they, they had tested positive. So I think it turned out not to be near as bad as we thought. I think you had mentioned it to me one other time I was talking with you. If a person passed away and they had the COVID-19, it had to go down on the record as a COVID-19 death. That that's yes, that's a that's a required uh yeah, death certificate has two parts to fill out, the cause of death and then it has contributing factors to death. And uh, the in Georgia, at least, and I think it's nationwide, uh, they have mandated that COVID-19 has to go up as a cause of death. One of the one of the top three lines is a cause of death, rather than a contributing cause. So it it actually inflates our number. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the people that died with COVID, if somebody died even two week two months after they had it. Uh, We've got to put that down. So the so, numbers may be a little higher. Excuse me. The numbers well, may be are. a little bit higher. Yeah, they, they are. They are. And and actually, it's even more than that, too, that the numbers seem to be going up still. But that means the death certificates are finding they're finally finding their way through the system and back to the state. Yes, they talked about the lag factor, uh, even though the actual virus being caught by various people that has gone down the deaths still were going seem to be going up because of the delay yeah thank you yeah 
Does anybody here amongst the panelists uh, have somebody they knew that passed away from coronavirus? Sure. Rob, did you? Yeah. And Brother Jacob. Yeah, okay, so a number of you have. Okay, that's great. To let, let us know that you had that experience. How did you feel when you heard that news? You know, in, a, in a Bethany Chapel's case, we had a, a dear brother um, who uh, had uh, was actually one of the early on people to succumb to the uh, to the issue. We had just made the decision, and frankly, it was in large part owing to uh, Dr. Reimer. Uh, the day before, we had had a, a conversation, the elders, about should we uh, open the meeting or not. And uh, this is when everything was just breaking. We had been meeting each Sunday, and uh, and we weren't sure if this was an overreaction or not. And uh, after talking to Dr. Reimer, he kind of really said, look, I think this is going to be a bigger illness than what we realize. I would recommend, especially in New York, you guys go ahead and close the meeting and uh, and just meet online. And, and we did that. The interesting thing is the one brother who, who died from this in our chapel, he didn't get the word and he actually showed up the next day at, at the chapel. And uh, we really see the wisdom, you know, the Lord was in the thing. And, you know, there's a scripture that says, uh, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of, of love and of a sound mind. But, um, you know, uh, uh, in a sense, we're grateful the Lord used Dr. Reimer and one of the elders in the chapel, uh, Brother O'Connor, to really say, let's let's not meet now. And But you asked me, how did we feel? Um you know, he, this dear brother, you just loved him. You loved to hug him, and, and we all love to hug him. And and um, I think the Lord probably, uh, through the wisdom of some of these brothers, um, maybe kept kept us from, from catching it. But, boy, we miss him. And I'd say that's probably yeah. the, the response we had is we just really missed the brother. And he was only in our fellowship for a little over a year, a couple of years. But, um, but yeah. So a real sense of loss that you experienced, yeah. Well, one of the sources. Of I say something. I think you know all of us process all these things very differently. Um, I was exposed actually to the virus, um, and uh, you can imagine, you know, coming home having to tell your wife that you've been exposed, and you know, don't yeah. going through the, the different things. Uh, but the Lord was gracious, and uh, you know, uh, we did. You know, even a month before that, we had gone to India. Uh, so you know, we had done in a lot of. A lot of times, you know, we also have the Lord tells us to protect ourselves also, uh, making sure that, you know, you're taking care of yourself physically, mentally. Uh, and, and that's all important just as much as reading the word and staying in faith. And I, you know, uh, that's something I thank the Lord for helping us through this, because, you know, a lot of times you tend to neglect the simple things, just like drinking some water. We forget that that could be a very powerful defense against a lot of things, you know. So. Just uh, just want to encourage everyone to to stay uh, in the in the protect well healthy mode I would say. Yeah, Dr. Price, you have something to add. Well, I I really appreciate Dr. Reimer's perspective, and um, uh, I have um, a very short uh, moment. Um, but um, I saw a patient in the emergency department, and uh, they had symptoms that could be with consistent with COVID nineteen. So I said, well, let's do everything. So I had face mask and glove, just the whole thing. And uh, I went to examine her and there's nothing more frightening for me personally than to have to lower their mask and look into their throat, you know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, I, and I did it on this patient thinking I'm just gonna be showered with virus. You know? And I saw the most angry looking throat I've seen in an adult, <laughs> usually adults don't get that. And so I, I, I uh, you know, the protocol is you test for influenza and anything else you might find. So I checked her for strep. And she's about, I don't know, in her fifth or sixth decade of life. Usually don't get strep throat at that decade. So I'm kind of worried. You know, John, you, you know what I'm saying, right? This is kind of, I, I'm kind of sweating. And I'm starting to think about all my family. And I've got two elderly men at home. What am I going to do? And her, they called me from the lab as soon. They usually don't call me. They called me and said, Dr. Price. The strep is positive. The strep is positive. And I tell you, I was never so happy to tell somebody that had strep throat in my life. And I want you to know she was never so happy to hear that she had strep throat. So I know yeah. Dr. Reimer would appreciate that. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a great anecdote that you have there. Um, you know, when this has been, was, was unfolding, 
we heard of uh, the heroes on the front line. Wherever I drive, I pass a hospital, pass a senior care facility, it's big banners, heroes work here. I mean, the front line defense uh, against this pandemic and people in the healthcare system taking care. There must have been real fear there too, because we've heard about people quitting their jobs because they didn't want to catch it, even in the yeah. Health department. What I could, if that's all right, if I may address that, yeah, Mark, but, um, you know, I have several of my family in the healthcare field, colleagues like Dr. Reimer and, um, um, uh, and myself. And so uh, I, I picked up a few extra hours to work and, and uh, it causes you fear on several levels. Personally, as a healthcare provider, it causes you fear that you may get it and you may die, uh, as Dr. Reimer experienced, but also you may get it, survive, and give it to others who then die on your watch. That's right. very frightening. That, that that you're responsible for that. That that's on you, and uh, you know all the people that you touch in a family setting. Uh, but it really uh, it really uh, shook others in my family too. My my uh, uh, lovely daughter, one of them is a nurse, and she had the same fear. She's a hospice nurse, and you know going to different homes and going to different nursing homes, and she. She was so um, almost, uh, um, I wouldn't say paranoid, but just really concerned. I've got to do everything right so that I don't transmit it, uh, bring it home or cause somebody else or be the person that spreads it to another 90 people in this facility. So it causes a tremendous sense of, of almost extended burden that right. uh, I really don't think you can bear. And, and the thing I told her, and maybe this is for those in the healthcare field is, you know, the truth is, is you're going to do everything perfect and people are still going to contract the disease. Yeah. That's the nature of the disease. And, and, that's, and that's an important thing to realize that in healthcare, you do the best you can, you train, you do everything you're supposed to do. And if somebody, somebody still gets the illness on your care, it's not because you failed. It's because you did what you're supposed to do and the disease still went past you. That's the way life in general is. And so, so it's almost giving yourself permission to be on the front lines and not be responsible for everyone's contraction of the disease. Okay, thank you. Dr. Price, you are a family man. You have a large family, so that means a lot to you when you're talking about your children and you know your extended family, mother, and father, and others. And you're caring for both sides of the aisle, so to speak. That's so uh, Taking care of yeah. senior care, yeah. So, um, the toll that that can take, the worry, the uh, the fear of maybe contracting it or giving it to someone, that's got to right. take a toll on the family. And I'm not saying necessarily what happened with you, but yeah. can't that eventually cause depression? Uh, can oh. that cause all that anxiety, all that the wearing down emotionally yeah. becomes yeah. a very thin barrier, and you can lose your temper easily and that sort of thing. Can you talk about that for us? Well, first of all, I, I I don't want to confess that I lose my temper easily, but <laughs> it happened, you know. Yeah. Um, Mark, you, you're very perceptive on this, and and this is a kind of burden that is not it's it's not like a, a hundred pounds immediately. It's it's one of those weights that you carry for um, many days in a row, and it's just a, a constant pressure on you. So even when you're not thinking about it, you you end up thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and when you think about it for your elder, you know, we have two elderly gentlemen, my father and father-in-law live with us. And I'm very worried about them. So I put in lots of restrictions. Um, no one was allowed to visit us at all. Well, that creates another problem. There's no socialization or outlet for all the other healthy people in the house, not to mention the fathers. And so it creates, it, it almost heightens the, the, um, uh, right. the isolation factor. I wouldn't have thought that was um, too bad on the children, but my little nine-year-old came up to me and said, "Daddy, when is this all going to end? You know, right. when when can we stop this?" And so, so you could tell that that it affects everybody at their level, at their level. Uh, your comment, does it produce anxiety? Yeah, it's a slow brewer. It hap yeah. it's it's a slow burner, and it happens over time. And so, I think what we do is we compensate. And we try to make compensatory mechanisms to survive this sort of constant weight, this pressure. But eventually, as any physiology will happen, uh, and if you could say emotionality, 
we we exhaust our compensatory mechanisms. We we tend to uh, uh, run out of gas, as it were, and thus it shows up in and sometimes it shows up in withdrawal. Sometimes it shows up in depressive type of symptoms. Sometimes it shows up in loss of temper, as if I'm just tired of this. I just want it to end. They're in, and I think the thing that that perhaps has caused us the greatest problem is we don't see an endpoint. Sometimes, a lot of times, when we can see that there's light at the end of the tunnel, we think, okay, I just just need to go a little bit further. We're almost there. But there isn't a light at this tunnel. There's, it feels as if it's going to go on forever. And so this idea of longevity, I think, creates a measure of anxiety and subsequent fear. Uh, one of the brothers, I think it was Dr. Jacob, mentioned about fear. And, and I find that most of our fears are things that of what might happen, what could be, what, what, what if. And it's as if we create scenarios that cause us to cower. It's not unusual. The disciples met that. Remember when they were on the Sea of Galilee and uh, it was a stormy night and the Lord Jesus goes walking by. Instead of saying, hey, that looks like Jesus, they said, that's a ghost. That was all in their head. Right. And so the fear factor dominated them so, dominated them so much they became in a frenzied panic. And this is very analogous to what we are going through with our, when our fears begin to grip us to this degree. Someone said uh, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Yes. And it does when we're tired and we have that thin barrier. And uh, we can see how that all, you know, and I think about the children too, don't the children? Uh, you're, you're involved with family ministry, the children, feel like they've been gypped. I mean, the graduations for yeah. seniors yes, by the wayside. I mean, they try to make something of it with the honking parade and all that yes. sort of stuff in the course. But yes, they, they're uh, missing out on summer camp. They're missing yeah. out on VBS. Yeah, they take Bible schools all over. You know, that's, well, that's got to create some stress. Of course. Yeah, it's very personal for us. My my son is, is graduating this year and and we postponed it. We postponed it. We canceled it. We canceled it. We reinstated it. We canceled it. I mean, it's just a roller coaster for him. So, you know, uh, one, you, one of the things that our assembly did and, and our friends did was basically said, hey, now we're to a point where we can at least have something for the graduates at our assembly. And they put it together. And it's, it's sort of like uh, the families at the chapel parking lot and all the, all the friends and chapel members have to drive by. And say thank and congratulations, and it was brilliant. It was just brilliant. It's supposed to happen next Sunday, uh, yeah. but you have to creatively think of ways because these are these are things that mean a lot. They're kind of once in a lifetime events. I was involved with a Zoom call that uh, one of the nursing students in New Jersey graduated, and they asked me to be the commencement speaker, <laughs> and so I zoomed in and and uh, and gave a commencement address for that hour and a half uh, uh, event. So. Uh, though you're right, it, it affects people deeply and people graduating, people finishing milestones in their lives. I tell you, you, you won't be able to go back this way anymore. Um, yes. What marriages have been put on hold. So Yes, yes Rob, you have a comment to make. I was actually going to throw this to Dr. Leary since he's the chairman of uh, Emmaus. Yes. But, that, that was uh, my next guy I was focusing on. Go ahead. Well, but I was just going to add that, um, you know, back in 2001, uh, you know, a lot of kids will a lot of now adults will talk about being part of that class of, of 2001 that uh, where they entered a whole different world because of 9-11 right. and I, right. have, I have a niece who just graduated from high school and they're going to refer to the class of 2020 in, in much the same way it's going to be different but Dr. Leary uh, this has affected the college uh, you're the expert on this so yeah the educational aspect of it uh, there's two questions I had for Dr. Leary I wanted to shift to him now First off, your professional experience. Uh, can you explain to the audience watching some of your experience going overseas and dealing with the bird flu uh, pandemic and things along those lines? Can you give us a perspective on this coronavirus? And how does it rate? It seems big in our eyes. We're hearing continually the comparison in 1918. But uh, can you give us some perspective on these things? What's going on and what, what happened? Are we in for more of this down the road? Well, there were uh, there were two concerns, <clears throat> excuse me, um, related to zoonoses. One was the bird was the bird flu, and another was uh, swine swine flu. And 
um, for reasons uh, unknown, at least to me, swine are uh, are known as uh, viral incubators, and and uh, and in and viruses mutate in swine. So the concern was, even with the bird flu, that um, it would enter, it would get into swine and mutate into a virus that could infect humans. So. Um, you know, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture became got in, involved quickly in uh, both cases, and uh, and in, implemented quarantines to uh, isolate the infected uh, infected farms. And uh, it was uh, talk about depression. Those uh, families that lost their entire um, income. I watched seventy thousand turkeys being um, populated. On a farm one Saturday owned by some uh, some a Christian family, and uh, it was it was uh, you know very sad. So um, you know, but this I have, I have no idea. I think it's going to be interesting to see if if we ever or to know if we ever do whether this in fact originated from the lab or whether it came came through some animals out of the market. It's still undetermined at, at this point, but. Um, it's certainly a much more uh, much more quickly became a, a, a problem for human beings and uh, and a you know, more much more severe much, um, yeah virus, you know, causing a higher excuse me a higher mortality rate yeah you know. it does uh, it, it can jump from the animal world to humans somehow some way do you know anything about that? Well, there's there's a a, re, a particular receptor that's in human beings, and it's in some animals, uh, felines, and uh, ferrets are two that come to mind. And so um, those those um, gen genera seem to be susceptible. There's been you know, cases of some tigers testing positive and. There was a uh, you know one cat and uh, some the dog uh, recent dog case turned uh, a later report negated the original finding so hmm, yeah. so and and dogs aren't known to have this, this particular receptor so um, I have a son we have a son who's uh, who's immunosuppressed from a medical condition and he has a ferret I hmm. I. Uh, I didn't get very far with suggesting he might find another home for it. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like that sound of that, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. um, it seems that a lot of the viruses come out of Asia. I'm not pinpointing a particular country, but it seems like it comes from Asia. I remember growing up when I was young, hearing of the Hong Kong flu and things along these lines. Now they're changing it calling it COVID-19, I assume because the, it was discovered in 2019. Am I right on that? Is that why it's called the 19? Yeah. And so it was here probably sooner than we think. And of course, now they have all these the H1N1 and all, all those different types of names. But um, tell us a little bit more about, uh, I mean, you're chairman of the board of uh, Mayus Bible College. Maybe you can't speak uh regarding mayus but other institutions what's it look like for students going back to school is there is there some question whether or not they're going to even do that uh, a lot of questions but ask you before i get there i don't want to interrupt dr price did you have a comment about the oh, i didn't see that if you had one yeah, he no had, actually had I, uh thank you dr leary actually i was i was uh interested in your comments uh, for the students uh, and, and not just the Mayus oh, students, but all yeah, students. I was very right. intrigued by that original question. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So I, you know, I've, I've spoken with uh, grand grandchildren of a young lady who finished uh, summa cum laude in high school and nothing, you know, as far as uh, communication or as graduation goes and so on. She's, uh, uh, pretty uh, a bit upset about that. The um, for the younger younger uh, kids in elementary, middle, and and high schools, it's um, it's been a problem. And uh, and uh, in our area, where two of our grand 
children attend, they moved to online and uh, it's in a middle class kind of school district and uh, um, at least 15% of the students never even bothered to get online for the rest of the school year. Mm -hmm. just, that was just it. The last several months. Schools so are washed. Not much of an educational experience there for them. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw some, I'll do this briefly, some numbers in California, they had uh, 6.2 million students and 1.2 million never, never got online, 20%. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles, uh, um, had uh, 15,000 of their 105,000 high, sc high schoolers never even bothered to get online after they went there. So they didn't really finish their year. So it's a problem for parents, those, um, those parents, uh, you know, those that are uh, serious about their children's education as our two grandchildren were because their um, the mother is a, uh, an ASL ed grad. <laughs> and, uh, and she commented on the concerns about um, you know working working parents that she knows and uh, and you know, she can't leave some of the younger children home during the day and and the, and, the, and the older ones if you leave them home are they really being disciplined enough to get get online and do their work so that's an issue as, as to colleges um, there are 3.7 million uh, recent high school graduates in the country. Usually about 70% of those uh, plan to attend uh, college or university in, in, of some sort. Uh, so that's 2.8. Normally about 5% uh, determine that they're not going to go that first year. They're going to take what's called a gap year. Yeah. That would be about uh, roughly 150,000. This year, the surveys are showing, I've seen three surveys, and they range from 16 to 25%. Of those, of those three points, uh, of those 2.8 million that would normally go, are going to take a gap year. So that's somewhere between 450 and 725,000 um, high school graduates that are going to be uh, looking for work and and competing for jobs in this uh, difficult, currently difficult economy. And um, you know the the lost academia, which is always in my mind is with, with the mass concerns is the general they're looking at a 4.5 billion dollar um, loss in tuition to these various right. institutions so adding adding to the stress then is uh, to your question mark is what's going to happen in the fall and um, there are there are many scenarios out there i'll review some i'll review some later but it's caused in a, i know in, in a public school here where um, our youngest son is a senior administrator, one of the counselors at the school is a friend of his and said that uh, their counseling um, requests went up 400 percent mm, right just in, in this recent recent time. I, I spoke to the uh, to our main counselor at Emmaus about this to see and um, at this Christian school, you know with with our our, our Christian solid Christian kids and I'm not bragging about a mass, although I've been accused of that before. <laughs> our, our lawyer, foster daughter, accuses me of being shameless, and she is, <laughs> I do it without apology. Anyway, uh, he said that th he didn't, didn't really see an uptick in, uh, in requests, which uh, kind of surprised, kind of surprised me, but, but, uh, that's, but it's, it's out there in uh, great, great levels. A uh, number of universities uh, are being uh, sued um, for not providing appropriate, um, adequate, edu an adequate education experience, as the uh, one lawsuit reads against the University of Missouri, for wow. example. Um, wow. And um, the students um, bemoan not being on campus and being with their, having their, their relationships are, uh, are of course, on, when they're online, are just not available with teachers and friends and even in uh, you know, some cases, romantic, romantic relationships, and they have difficulty uh, articulating those needs um, via, via the internet. Let me interrupt you for one second, Dr. Leary. Let me ask, Dr. Price had a, a comment to make. Uh, it might have been back a minute or two ago. Dr. Yes, uh, Dr. Leary, I, I can't remember exactly what you said to me, but 
it seems like parents were also afraid to let their children go. Yeah. What, what was that statistic? Yeah, that was, I'm just, it was very I'm interesting. Not, I'm, just, I'm just getting to that. So. Oh, my uh, apologies. Right, Good. No, perfect no timing. No, it's, it's an important, important point. Um, so, um, you know, for for new students as well, then what uh, what are they looking at? You know, when's college going to be open? If if the college they're interested in is, um, is hasn't decided yet how they're even going to, to conduct business, they don't know if they want to go there or not. Um, there's no campus tours available, and um, uh, a number of uh, universities are dropping the requirement for ACT SAT tests. Oh. And um, so to, Steve, uh, to Dr. Price's question, I uh, read two surveys. One said that 33% uh, of parents now want their, their child going to, uh, to college within 50 miles of home. And another was uh, even more significant, 70% said they wanted their kid within 60 miles of home. So I, mean, I guess you know, the thought of their kid being three or 400 miles away in a large institution where um, they don't know how the controls are being implemented regarding the health healthcare needs, you know, it's a, a real, a real worry for them. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, some of that's probably contributing to that large gap year percentage that uh, increase. Yeah, very good. About five times, up to five times the normal. And uh, so colleges are now calling wait list, you know, kids that have been on the wait list and <laughs> seeing if they yeah. in fact want to come because the enrollments are, are down. And, uh, and and students are waiting till later as, to see if they're going to commit to going anywhere. What's going to so, happen? Yes. Yeah. So so colleges are looking at, you know, they're considering um, uh, meeting as as normal. And uh, for the for the Christian uh, colleges that are met, part of the, of an organization called Association for Biblical Higher Education, that survey shows that 60% of them currently plan to uh, have uh, class as usual this fall. Mm. The board at Emmaus looked at eight different scenarios, and um, we don't dictate to the administration what they do, but as a board, but uh, they're waiting. To, it's going to be dependent on how how things look yeah. as far as infection, infection rates and so on come fall. So uh, there's some striking examples. The University of Cambridge in England, and and I looked like I couldn't believe it. So I. I looked again today to uh, to confirm it, and uh, it, it's it's still true. They've decided to have to have online uh, only online education for the entire next school year, 2021. Wow! Wow! And, the furniture um, is getting rearranged. There's no question about it. I want uh, to go to Dr. Jacob right here. He wanted to comment on your uh, your, yeah, your comment. Sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Jacob. All right. You know, these statistics are really daunting, and I think it's really interesting to hear them. And I just wanted to encourage, you know, I'm sure there are many of us who are listening here, maybe leaders in your own right, oversight and others. And, uh, you know, Psalms 23 remind us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He may restore my soul. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Uh, and then it goes on to say, even though I walk through the shadow of death, thou shall not fear no evil. So I just want to encourage all of you uh, and even us uh, to really uh, strengthen ourselves in the Lord and the things that matters in family, uh, in, in our community, because uh, it, we don't know the, the, the dramatic, this is going to be a dramatic effect. This may be even bigger than the depression itself, because this, this kind of toll that it's going to take has taken on the world is not known at all. And it's going to take a lot of adequate and uh, spiritual leadership that are going to right this ship. The government will not be able to do it because they don't have, most of them are not moral anyway. So, you know, but it's going to take a lot of spiritual leaders who are going to stand in the gap to, res to res rescue our communities, our families. So it's really important that we as leaders and educators encourage each other and strengthen uh, and really become strong. And I myself, you know, I've started to do that. I reconnected with my spiritual um, mentor in my college just to just to get myself in a position where I could withstand what's about what I'm going through uh, as well as uh, so I encourage others to do that because it's going there's a tremendous need for 
exemplary leadership that strives for excellence rather than just doing um, things that other people ask him to do what seems to be uh, public opinion. But so I just wanted to encourage everyone to do that. Yeah, amen. And thank you for that exhortation. Yes, Dr. Reimer, go ahead. Yeah, and I just want to tag on to what Dr. Jacob said. I, you know, we're really, we're really optimistic. There's a lot of pessimistic voices out there that, uh, you know, this will never go away. We're all going to die and so on. But, but uh, uh, many, many assemblies are in the process of opening back up, getting back together. We're going to open uh, again uh, next Sunday. And, uh, and I would just encourage uh, you in the assembly and you elders to, to go ahead in a safe way when it's the appropriate time just open up. You have the book throughout the book of Acts and Corinthians, we read when you come together. Uh, well, Zoom is good and these other electronic meetings are good and they have their purpose, but they're not coming together physically. Right. When to come together in one place, it says a couple times. And we do need to come together and, and encourage one another. Amen. Thank you for that encouragement, and Dr. Jacob as well. And Dr. O'Leary, those uh, statistics were phenomenal. Thank you. It's worth the cost of admission for this webinar. It was tremendous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, to yeah, transition right. here. Yeah, remains to be seen where we're, where we're going. And some, some are uh, able, institutions like Emmaus are able to provide private rooms, for example. So that's, right. that's a help. To, to add on to what uh, uh, two doctors just just said, yeah. We and it was, we talked earlier about fear. I um, um, we can't we can't let it uh, paralyze us as right. uh, as as it could. So uh, if I might, there's a couple of uh, quotes from uh, years before. One is from 398. The only thing we need to be afraid of is fearing anything more than God. And then Oswald Chambers said around 1900, when you fear God. You fear nothing else. If you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah good comments. Uh, I'm going to go to, to Rob Sullivan, but Dr. Price, you have a brief comment? Oh, I just, that? Yeah, just, uh, you know, um, this whole, the whole thing that had for, in our years in past, for, for example, when Y2K was with us, I remember people asking, so what are we going to do about Y2K? And I said, well, how do, how do we live now before Y2K? Well, we live by faith. Well, that's how we're going to live after Y2K. <laughs> Same thing when, when the Twin Towers went down. And then not many would actually cite this, but uh, I was um, working full time when H1N1 came in. And I was, I was coding 40-year-old pregnant women that just, just, gave, uh, just uh, delivered their babies. I mean, this was horrific loss of life. And the scripture that I think was is really quite germane to us is, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield. Truth, that requires our faith. And, uh, and Buckler, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because the Lord, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. I think that's that's the key. It's, it's, it's a real exercise of faith for us, right? We have to trust in, in, in nothing else but the Lord on this. And, and the last time I read the scriptures, which was not too long ago, without faith, we can't please God. So God is positioning us in a place to please him. Yeah, now, this message you will not hear on the news, will you? You won't hear this on CNN. You won't hear this even on Fox News. I mean, as good as I think they are. This is uh, bringing the word of God to bear upon our experience. I want to segue here to Rob Sullivan. Especially uh, following on the heels of Dr. Leary's statistics about finances and college and everything else, seems like a natural connection right there. Um, finances cause stress, and uh, things are tough enough with finances. Rob, tell us how this is all of our lives have been affected by the pandemic. Give us a perspective from the financial world. 
Mm. Sure, and and uh, just to tie in a little bit to what has been said, I look on this call, and there's I think every one of you brothers is an elder in a meeting, and and I just became an elder a few months ago, and our need to be agile, responding to different problems, from what I understand, talking to other brothers, it has just grown and grown quite a bit because there's so many different uh, challenges that seem to be coming at once. But to your question, Mark, uh, this is a different this is a different animal. Um, we've had 24 million people apply for unemployment. Uh, we've never seen a rash like this. Th this has come out of nowhere. We've seen the market. Uh, in February, it's uh, the Dow is approaching 30,000, and by March 23rd, it had dropped down near 19,000. And uh, don't just think of that as the fat cats on Wall Street. That means pensions, that means retirement funds, that means IRAs, that affects everybody. And uh, and on top of that, you have people who uh, are just struggling to make their, their payments, their mortgage payments. These are real practical things. Uh, uh, I read somewhere that something like 9% of mortgages are in some form of arrears right now. Uh, there's four and a half million, uh, uh, what's the number I've got? Uh, Three million auto loans are, are, are behind and something like 15 million credit cards uh, payments are, are in arrears. And, and we don't just want to keep throwing statistics at you because, in fact, it makes the problem seem bigger right. than the solution. When the solution, going right to what Brother uh, Price, uh, uh, Dr. Price was referring to, has everything to do with trusting in, in the Lord. Um, we think uh, Dr. Price and I... Uh, uh, I don't know, back in February, we were down at the Workers and Elders Conference, and uh, I guess it was North Carolina. All these places get merged together for me, and we had a brief side conversation about ACM was potentially expanding their remit to help people with, uh, you know, as part of their telemedicine process to help them with uh, even counseling issues. And, and I remember, I don't know if you remember this, Dr. Price, but we were talking about Saul versus yes. Elijah. Yes. You know, both of them experienced depression and anxiety, and with good reason at different points, but you see a complete different response. Yeah, Saul right. is very much given over to depression, very much given over to anxiety. He turns from the Lord, repeatedly turns from the Lord, very even though point. the Lord had given him Samuel, who keeps chasing him. Yes. And meanwhile, you look at his response versus Elijah. Yes. You know, Elijah yes. is so down, and it's funny, yes. uh, one of the brothers, when we were doing the practice uh, run for this call, um, it was when Elijah was personally threatened that he, right. he took off and run, uh, took off and ran, and, and yet the Lord came to him, and um, the answer is still the same. It, it's trusting him. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but, um, you know, uh, uh, Jabe Nicholson talks about Psalm 11, and it's, there's a verse there, and I think it's verse 4, it might not be right in the verse, it says, uh, God's eyelids test the sons of men. Sometimes it appears that God may be, uh, oblivious to what's going on, but he's not. Sometimes it may appear that he he doesn't know what's going on, but of course he he does. And and uh, the answer is still the same. There's no doubt there has been horrific financial hardships that have fallen on people. Mm -hmm. One of our elders in the meeting has, has had to close down his restaurant, and and uh, I think we've had six or seven in the chapel fellowship. And we're not big. We're 40 or 50. We've had six or seven who've lost their jobs. Um, but, but the answer is still the same. You trust the Lord. Uh, there, there's a verse that says, Psalm 24, says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Uh, that means you even approach your wealth as if it's a stewardship. You approach your time, your talent, your thought life, and your treasure. Think of the parable of the unjust steward. They're stewards before the Lord. And if you approach even your wealth, even uh, how to pay your bills as if it's a stewardship and trust him, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, my sister and her husband are about to send their, their uh, daughter off to a four-year college. And I think they're going to try to go forward the, the university she's looking at going to. You know, boom, there's an, another an enormous bill that they've got to take care of. These are real, real things. They're real challenges. Very practical, right. And yet you still have to trust the Lord through these things. And it's amazing how these type of things can draw you closer to him. One last quick anecdote. I know we're running out of time, but my mother... Um, you know, my dad died. She was, uh, she had two little kids. I was five. My sister was seven and he didn't have any life insurance. Can you imagine? Not a, a, bare, a little bit of life insurance. And we had this home. Um, she taught us and she wasn't a believer at the time. She got saved later on, but
but she would say things like this to us. You know, I've worried about money and my finances all day long. I'm going to go to bed and turn it over to the Lord. Well, I've got news for you. You can turn it over to him right now. And uh, doesn't mean you're still not going to go through some rough, rough spots, but he's the same God and, and he'll be there for you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise that uh, the Lord gave to us in the book of Hebrews. So j just those thoughts in a little time, uh, Brother Mark. And to finish that verse, that they may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do unto me? And so that's a real trust in the Lord, really asking him to guide us and direct us and sustain us even in the midst of famine or in the midst of pestilence or any other disaster, world catastrophe, whatever it might be. Amen. Our time is running out. I knew that we could go on and on once we get rolling with these things. But what I'd like to do, uh, there is nearly 400 people that are watching this uh, broadcast. Oh. Perhaps thousands more that will listen after we record it and put it on the uh, internet. That's what happened with other webinars. So here's the uh, question I have for each one of the panelists. I want to just go right around. Just a very, very brief statement. What encouragement can you give to the person out there who's experiencing anxiety, fear, worry, doubt, uh, some ambivalent feeling, looming feeling of disaster on the horizon? What can you give them in the Lord to encourage them so that they can have hope, hope for mm -hmm. tomorrow, as the hymn says? We'll start with Dr. Price. Dr. Price. Oh. Thank you. Um, you know, the um, I think of the uh, incident with those disciples on the Sea of Galilee, and what they needed to do was to exchange their version of reality for the version of reality the Lord was saying to them. He said, don't be afraid, it is I. See, that's a different paradigm of reality than what they thought it was. They thought that the, the Grim Reaper was come to take them. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to look at all this happening around us, and we're gonna we're gonna then bring those thoughts which raise themselves in, in sort of a rebellious, frightful uh, uh, start against God, and bring it under the authority of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. To quote Second uh, uh, Corinthians ten four and five, and I think that's what we do. We we that that's we we allow God's word to enter into our mental capacities or that our emotional capacities follow suit uh, and exchange truth for what is a fear great wonderful words great that's tremendous fear not the fear not passages in the scripture mm -hmm. dr jacob what can you say for us well psalms 23 verse 6 says surely goodness and mercy should follow me all the days of my life yes. and i'll be in the house of the lord forever yeah. Uh, I think, you know, in my life, what I've experienced is when I trusted the Lord to do what I cannot do, he added immensely to the trust I placed in him. Oh, and great. whether it's experience of getting my PhD, getting married, uh, even going through all of this, uh, we have to trust the Lord uh, immensely, as Rob reminded us, that you just got to trust him completely. And when you do that, he will add immensely and bring a future that you know I has not seen here, not uh, he I has not seen here, has not heard, not even imagine in their hearts. And we could be at the true of the cups of the either Lord coming or seeing amazing uh, amount of people coming to the know the, the, the Lord Jesus. In either Amen. we give thanks. Amen. 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 Great. Dr. Reimer. Yeah, there's a there's an amazing verse I read the other day, John 14:23. It says Jesus answered and said unto him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We will come to him and make our home with him. That's the, the triune God wants to come into our lives. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We invite him in. And boy, with it comes all the peace and of his presence and the power and the wisdom from him peace that he gives that's right dr larry what words can you give us as i've gotten older i think more and more about uh being in my mid-70s about eternity and uh and and the great uh the great privilege we have of uh resting in the lord's eternal perfect plan and and having an eternal perspective on on life uh, from hebrews 6 19 we have this we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner 
on our behalf. So we just briefly, you know, we have a hope of resurrection, of righteousness, of his appearing, of salvation, and uh, of eternal life. And it's all wrapped up in our precious Savior. Thank you very much. Excellent words as well. Rob, I'm going to ask you to uh, say the same thing, but maybe you can wrap it up in a little extended comment here and I want you to yeah. give us a little perspective. Sure. And I'm going to ask uh, Robbie if he would give me control of the screen uh, um, just to tie in with what we've just been talking about. So let's hope I do this right. Well, we've been talking a lot about um, uh, the symptoms and some of the emotions we've experienced, uh, you know, coming out of this virus. And really, uh, it could be any response that we have to any problem that might be bigger than ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, things like fear and anxiety and depression and, and maybe even anger. Um, but we thought we would finish up, and you you sensed it from these brothers' comments right at the end here, talking about the antidote, if I could use that expression. And it really does uh, have everything to do with uh, trusting in the Lord. So I thought just to illustrate this, we might look at a, a scene, another scene from the Sea of Galilee uh, during another storm and look at how the disciples responded to a, a turmoil in their life, a, a bad situation that they were in and look at two mistakes they made. And then they did one thing right. And it's uh, from Mark four uh, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great, great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. And look at this. But the Lord was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are uh, perishing? Uh, whenever I read this passage, I always think of that verse uh, in first Timothy uh, three and without uh, controversy great is the mystery of godliness uh, God was manifested in the flesh think about this uh, uh, the God of the universe the very one who's holding the whole universe together by the power of his word and yet he needs to take a nap um, beauty of the incarnation but there are two mistakes the disciples make and I think they're the same two mistakes that a lot of us make the first one is that they supposed they had to wake him up to bring it to his attention that there was a storm going on. Uh, there's a, a, a good brother who works on my staff at Believer's Stewardship Services named uh, John Glock. And uh, he was speaking at Bethany last week. He's going to speak tomorrow, and I'm going to totally steer, steal an expression that he, uh, he uses. But in the midst of times of trouble, heartache, and consternation, we need to think biblically. We need to think accurately or correctly about the doctrine of theology proper. And if you don't know what theology proper is, that's okay. It's just a big fancy term theologians use to talk about the attributes of God. When you're going through trials and troubles in life and heartaches and, and things like pandemics or societal upheaval or even social injustice or, or any great problem that's out there, uh, we need to think about the attributes of God and, and look at those problems through that prism. He didn't need them to wake him up to let him know that there was a storm going on. This is what uh, David says in, in the psalm regarding God's knowledge. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and then laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. Lord Jesus Christ isn't just omniscient, he doesn't know everything that there is. He doesn't just know everything that there is to know. He knows everything that's potential. He knows the outcome of every choice that will never be made. That's omniscience on steroids. And he certainly knows what you're going through. And he knows what we're going through. Um, that's the first mistake they made is they thought that they he didn't know what was happening. The other mistake that they made was that they thought maybe he didn't care. They say, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? 
like he didn't care what they were going through. This is from uh, Lamentations 3. Um, it's amazing some of the most profound thoughts about trusting in God and the hope uh, that is found in him. In the worst of times, it shows up in the scripture. You think about when Lamentations is written by Jeremiah. It's right after Jerusalem has been ransacked, the temple has been destroyed, and the children of Judah have been carried off into captivity. And there you find Jeremiah sitting outside one of the gates as he goes to pen uh, the book of Lamentations and just pour out his heart about how in despair that he is. And it comes to a head in Lamentations 3. Here's what, uh, what he writes. You've moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said my strength and my hope had perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. Here's Jeremiah. He is beset. He's despairing. He's given over to anxiety. And he is deeply depressed. And he thinks that his hope has perished from the Lord there in verse 18. But what does he start to do in verse 21? He starts to think about the attributes of God. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. You must think biblically when you're going through rough times because it puts a whole different paradigm on what's taking place. The reason that we can have hope in the Lord um, is because of who he is, what his character is. Um, Look at this passage. This is from Isaiah the one, uh, 26, one of my wife uh, Susie's uh, favorite passages. She, uh, Isaiah, again, writing at a time when uh, the northern kingdom of Israel is getting carried off into captivity. He writes this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. There's a key here to having peace, no matter what the turmoil of life that's going on is, and that's to trust in the Lord. The term that's used there for perfect peace, I'm told by Hebrew scholars, it's actually the word peace, peace. It literally means you've come through two sets of doors. It's like you're in an inner sanctum of peace that God gives you and shelters you out from the noise and the turmoil of the world. That's what's available to the one who trusts in the Lord. It's a great quote from F.B. Meyer. He says, we must see to it that our mind is stayed on God. For mind, the margin suggests imagination. It is through our imaginings that we get perturbed and defiled. We anticipate and fancy so many ogres. We harbor such dark forebodings. Chambers of imagery are thrown open to such unseemly company, hence our perturbation. Do not imagine, but trust. Do not anticipate, but leave God to choose. Looking forward strains the eyesight. Looking upward opens heaven. Think back to what Dr. Price just talked about was related to uh, Peter. Uh, you know, he, he walks on the water and uh, instead of looking at the Lord, he looks on the turmoil of the sea all around him and he thinks he's going to drown. And all the while, the God of the universe who controls that sea is standing there right with him. Don't, like, don't be like Peter in that regard. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Um, the one thing they did right, uh, the disciples, is in the one whom they approached. They approached the white, right one Amen. to uh, to rescue them. The Lord arose. First thing he does is he rebukes the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And then he rebukes them. He said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And mm. they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. Remember what Paul told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear trust the Lord. And that leads me to actually uh, a thought, I, you know, that Mark had asked me to convey and, and, and all of us in this panel want to convey to you. We don't know all of you who are on this call. There's a fear that some of you may have never put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. The fact is that is the only way to have ultimate peace. Yes. Uh, I'm a finance guy and, mm. uh, uh, you know, I listened to uh, Dave Ramsey and he says the ultimate way to peace is to know the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus the Lord. The reason that that's possible for you to have peace is because the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and died in our stead. And he took the full wrath of God's punishment upon himself. God as a righteous God must judge sin. But because he loves us and his compassions fail not, he provided us with a substitute, namely his son. This is what the scripture says. 
When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Mm -hmm. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You must put your trust in Christ Jesus the Lord, or as Isaiah 59 says, your sins have separated you from God, and you will be separated all for all of eternity from him. Don't do that. Last thing I have to say about storms is, I'm just going to quote Amy Carmichael here. It shows who's in the boat with you when you're going through the storms of life. Thou art the Lord who slept upon the pillow. Thou art the Lord who soothes the raging sea. What matter beating wind and tossing billow? If only we are in the boat with thee. Hold us in quiet through the age-long minute when thou art silent and the wind is shrill. Can the boat sink when thou, dear Lord, art in it? Can the heart faint that waiteth on thy will? You know, the other thing the disciples did when they reached out to him is they not only rescued uh, themselves, so to speak, they rescued all those other little boats that were traveling with them. Yeah. And we respond to this crisis Trusting in the Lord is going to make an impact, not just on ourselves or on our families, but a lot of those around us. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Mark asked me to close in prayer, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And thank you for, um, he'll come back with some final comments, but we definitely appreciate your time tonight. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can have the Lord Jesus Christ in the boat with us. The one who controls the waves and can control pandemics. Who knows what demonic force was behind this? Who knows if it's just not the natural consequence of a world that has gone in rebellion against God. What we do know for certain, Father, is that your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, overcame sin, death, and the devil. And because of that, we don't have to have a spirit of fear in light of the turmoils of life. So we lift these things up to you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rob, for that timely, timely word. Amen for all those scriptures shared. And thank you all of your panelists, the tremendous insights and uh, sharing your heart to, to the listening audience, not only the live audience that we have watching, but uh, it'll be expanded, we know, through the the power of the internet, this amazing tool. We want to use it for the Lord's sake and for his glory. Well, just a few uh, final announcements. First off, uh, then this will be recorded. Uh, each one who registered will receive that uh, information, will receive the link. It'll be on the Know the Word YouTube site. And you'll be able to share that with others as well. So um, be looking for that very soon. You're also going to receive a survey from us. Uh, we'd appreciate if you just take the few extra minutes that it would take to go through that survey. It's not very long at all. And that'll help us to make future webinars um, even uh, better. Uh, although I'm not sure I can get any better than the one that we had there this evening. Um, we uh, want to mention also that if you would want to just pray for the ministry and know the word, uh, these do cost money. If you want to have fellowship with Know the Word, you can go to donorbox.org uh, slash know the word and you can partner with us in that work. We do have a Facebook page. We do have a, an app. Uh, it's found at Know the Word Ministries. Make sure it's Know the Word Ministries because there's other know the, know the Words out there, I found out. But this one is Know the Word Ministries officially. And you can get the app. You can go to our website, knowtheword.com and find other events and ministries that we're involved with. Once again, we want to thank each one on the panel, and we want to thank Robbie, who is behind the scenes. Robbie, we didn't really see you that much this evening. Uh, many of the people, I'm sure, sent lots of questions. We will attempt to get to those questions uh, in the next couple of days. So uh, don't feel like uh, we've neglected you. We'll do our best to have brief comments made on those questions. Uh, again, keep uh, Robbie and Axius One in your prayers as well. He's tremendous in his abilities and has really been a great help to the Lord and uh, to the Lord's people, I should say, and uh, in various assemblies and various ministries. But once again, we want to thank you for attending. Uh, we appreciate it so much. Again, if you're there, let me give two exhortations. As Rob so clearly reminded us from the scriptures, that uh, the only way to have peace is to have the Prince of Peace in your life. And so we we pray that you trust the Lord Jesus as Savior. If you haven't done that already, if you've done that, it's easy, like the disciples who spent time with the Lord, to get your eyes off the Lord. It says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, 
whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusts in thee. That's the, that's the part of that verse that we need to make sure that we're obeying. Because he trusts in thee. We want to encourage Christians too in this very difficult time, this uncertain time. Uh, the Lord is our stay. The Lord is our helper. And uh, he will help us in all these things. So thank you very much for attending this evening. Uh, we have more webinars in store uh, down the road. And so anyone who registers for those will be notified of future webinars as well. We plan to have one uh, for, on a monthly basis for the next few months. So thank you for coming. God bless. And thank you again, panelists, for your participation this evening.